Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our Qualam County EDC coffee chat. We are really pleased to be able to host the Washington State Department of Ecology today so that they can share with us information about two big uh, legislative programs that were passed in uh, these last couple of years, and I know folks have been working on them for years. Um, one is the low carbon fuel standard, and then also the second op, um, program is called the Climate Commitment Act. So they are really massive funding and investment spending programs, and they are going to share with us how the programs will work, uh, what kind of things will be um, have a fee or a tax associated with it, and then what that money will go to. And then what I think we're specifically interested in here is, are there opportunities for local businesses or nonprofits or local governments to apply for some of that funding and so that we can improve our environment in Clown County. So with that, I am going to let Abby Brown from the Department of Ecology take it away. And she Great. can introduce her colleagues also. Sure, thank you so much, Colleen. Oh, and I'm other... so sorry, one thing. If anybody sure. has a question, please raise your hand or put your question in the chat. And if you will put your um, computer on mute so we don't inadvertently pick up any background noises, that would really be great. Thank you. Go ahead, Abby. Great, thank you. And I, I believe when I'm presenting my screen, I won't be able to see if hands are raised. So Colleen, if you feel free to interrupt me or, or we can do questions at the end, whatever you usually do. I like to make it kind of interactive. So we'll sure. probably doing, do it during if that's all right. That's Thanks. perfectly fine. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Abby Brown. I'm the policy lead for the Clean Fuel Standard uh, with the Department of Ecology. So I will share my screen and give you an overview of the program, um, an idea of where we are in the process. We haven't quite launched yet, but we're, we're coming up on launch very soon. So I wanna be sure that we are sharing information about the opportunities presented by the program um, so that you can take advantage of them. All right. And are you seeing my present presentation or presenter mode? Not presenter mode yet. I think you gotta, yeah. Oh, switch them? Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, great. There we go. Thank you. All right. Uh, and I have listed here as well because Andy is in the Andy Hayes from Ecology is in the presentation uh, at the climate policy section manager who manages uh, all of the other climate policies that are not the Climate Commitment Act is Joel Creswell. Uh, he's not able to join us this morning, but wanted to give him a shout out. So to quickly recap why this particular climate policy, the clean fuel standard is designed to address the largest source, the largest single source of Washington's greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and the associated air pollution that is detrimental to public health, especially for those living closest to roadways and other high traffic areas. And that's transportation, the single largest source of the state's emissions. So Washington is joining other West Coast jurisdictions like California, Oregon, and BC in having clean fuels programs that so were in good company. And beyond reducing emissions, the program aims to encourage technological innovation in the low carbon fuel space. Uh, economic development, and also to increase the availability and affordability of low carbon fuels. So what is exactly the clean fuel standard? The CFS statute, as Colleen mentioned, was passed in 2021 and requires fuel suppliers to gradually reduce the carbon intensity of transportation fuels 20% below 2017 levels by 2038, which is enough to cut Washington's statewide greenhouse gas emissions by 4.3 million metric tons per year. So fuels with a carbon intensity above the standard, above this green line, um, in, incur deficits and fuels with a carbon intensity below the standard earn credits. And at the end of each compliance period, which is the calendar year, 
deficit holders must purchase enough credits to meet the standard and come into compliance. Essentially, they have to purchase credits to cancel out their deficits. So this is a market-based system that is meant to provide financial incentive for low carbon fuels. So for the first decade of the program, the annual carbon intensity reduction is set by statute. That's the, the line that you see on the screen. In 2034, Ecology has the authority to set the reduction. And in the uh, actually the final rule that we just released on Monday, we propose, or in, in the draft rule that we released over the summer, and then also in the final rule that we released on Monday, we proposed a 10% reduction in 2034. This gets us to our overall goal of a 20% reduction four years early. This is a big step, yes, but we've performed an economic analysis and a fuel supply forecast in conjunction with the Department of Commerce, both of which anticipate that this is an achievable target given the abundance of, of credits that we anticipate, the decade of lead time for parties to plan ahead, um, and participants' ability to bank credits. So those that are earning credits don't necessarily have to post them for sale every year. They can actually hold on to them while compliance is easier in the early years of the program and then post them for sale uh, in the later years when they might be more valuable because compliance is getting a little trickier. So we've received widespread support for this action uh, from stakeholders and any effort that we can to reduce emissions as quickly as we possibly can. And this is as quickly as we can. And as I mentioned, we just released our final rule on Monday, which is very exciting. And that is ahead of our launch on January 1st. That is when the program will officially begin. So I mentioned carbon intensity a few times. So I wanna dig into what exactly that is. This is an area where we are a little bit different from the, uh, the Climate Commitment Act. So in the clean fuel standard, we measure the greenhouse gases over the full life cycle of the fuel. And this is done to fully capture the greenhouse gas impact of producing and using each fuel in Washington. So that's everything from how the oil or gas is extracted um, all the way to when it ends up in a vehicle. If it's a crop-based biofuel, we look at how that crop was grown, how it was transported to Washington. Uh, we look at how liquid the biofuels were processed, the energy it took to process them. And for the purposes of this program, electricity that is used to charge an electric vehicle is considered a fuel. So we also look at how that electricity was generated and we measure the emissions produced by that fuel and its production process over its full life cycle up to the point where it ends up in a vehicle. Uh, and who will be subject to the new regulations? So these apply to fuel producers and suppliers. Anyone who supplies a high carbon fuel or a fuel with the carbon intensity above the standard, as I mentioned, must participate. Suppliers of low carbon fuels don't have to participate, but if they do, they can opt into the program, generate and sell credits, which will earn them revenue. So we think there's a strong financial incentive to opt in and voluntarily participate. So, um, and Abby, on that, oh, sure. can you give examples of who are um, the high and low uh, carbon fuel types of uh, businesses. I actually have my next slide. Okay. I will get right awesome. to that. So, and then so someone the, also asked. You mentioned that all the stakeholders were supportive. Who were what or who are the stakeholders? <laughs> so we had uh, in our public comment period, we had eleven hundred comments. So I'm not going to run through all of them, but they ranged from the oil and gas industry biofuels companies, hydrogen fuel companies, electric utilities, environmental nonprofits, local governments, um, tribes who are not considered stakeholders, um, but were involved in the process as well. Um, Got it. And that's great. <laughs> yeah, there Thank was you. there was quite a range. Uh, the aviation industry. Um, yes, there's been there's been quite a bit of interest. And so essentially Oil and gas are the main high carbon fuels that are going to be generating deficits in the early years of the program. Some of these other fuels on the regulated side, you, you may be surprised by, for example, hydrogen or, or ethanol. And that's because depending on how those fuels are produced, their carbon intensity can actually be quite high. And so we want to include them in the program to encourage them to look at their production processes and aim for as low 
carbon intensive a process as possible. So that's why some of those are, are included as well. Uh, and electricity is an opt-in fuel, um, alternative jet fuel. So aviation, the aviation industry, maritime industry, and um, the rail industry are not required to participate in the program, but they may opt in and generate credits if they are using a low carbon fuel. And so we've actually had a lot of interest from the aviation industry in particular in looking at, at using more climate friendly fuels and opting into the program to be able to generate those credits. So let's get into some mechanics of how the program actually works. So a participant will register in the program using the Washington Fuel Reporting System. This is something we're still developing, but will be ready for launch by January 1st, which is when registration opens. The participant will track their energy usage over, uh, we, we work in a quarterly system, so over the span of a quarter. Uh, so they'll track either the kilowatt hours they've used to charge vehicles, the number of gallons, whatever is appropriate for their fuel. They report to Ecology quarterly and eventually annually on, the, on uh, exactly what occurred in that quarter. Ecology reviews the data, issues credits or deficits based on the carbon intensity and the amount of energy used. Then that participant may post, well, they may either save their credits, uh, like I mentioned earlier, or they can post them for sale on the open market. Um, I should note that Ecology is, so this is a market-based system. Ecology does not set the price of the credits. The credit price is set by general demand for credits. So anyone who is posting a credit for sale on our system will be able to look at who else is posting credits, what prices they listed for, um, and, and kind of adjust accordingly. <clears throat> and also none of the financial transaction comes through Ecology. It all happens between the, the, the seller of the credits and the buyer of the credits. So Ecology does not have any part to play in the, the financial transaction. And this is a, just a little sneak peek of the Washington fuel reporting system. This is where parties will register, where they will submit their reports. Uh, it is how uh, you submit fuel pathway applications, which is how we calculate carbon intensity. And it's also where the credit bank exists. So that is where one can post credits for sale. So there are a couple of different ways to be able to earn credits. One, of course, is for fueling a vehicle. That's kind of the, the key point of the program. Um, although there are a couple of other opportunities that I wanted to be sure um, to speak about today. One is capacity crediting or infrastructure crediting. And that is essentially, we're recognizing that for certain types of fuels, we need a little more infrastructure build out in order for them to be widely adopted. And also the infrastructure, the fueling infrastructure can sometimes be very costly. And so for DC fast charging for electric vehicles and for hydrogen refueling infrastructure, we're offering an additional opportunity to earn credits by building out that infrastructure. So that's separate from fueling a vehicle. This is just for building out the infrastructure. And this is something, this is an opportunity that will sunset over the life of the program. It's really meant to get the ball rolling at the beginning and then the market forces will help encourage further build out of infrastructure. And a third so is- With that, Abby, how would, um, if a company wanted to install an electric vehicle fast charging station at their um, site, mm -hmm. how would they apply for that? So our- it's, uh, there are some specific requirements that are laid out in the rule and apologies, I don't know every one of them off by heart, I can follow up later, but essentially they would have to anticipate how much use that might, or they'd have to estimate how much use that fueling station might get, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and how the, for example, the electricity would be generated in that particular area. Uh, and there's an application process to ecology. So then we, we um, would kind of look at the information that's provided to us and, and uh, issue credits based on that. Okay. But there, there are some specifics in our rule that I would um, encourage you to, to take a look at and I can follow up with that specific section of the rule as well. Okay, thank you. And then the, uh, the third opportunity for generating credits is called advanced crediting. And this is uh, specifically aimed for public entities. Um, and essentially they, they do a little bit like what I was just talking about, they anticipate what the cost of, or excuse me, so take the a ferry electrification, for example, um, WashDOT would uh, estimate how many credits that ferry would eventually be generating and ask Ecology 
or apply essentially for a loan of credits. And we would verify the information, issue those credits in advance that WashDOT could then um, put up for sale on the market and earn revenue on that would help fund the actual conversion of the ferry to electric. And then that ferry would not be able to generate new credits until that initial loan is paid back. And then once it is, they would be able to generate credits normally. So this is kind of in recognition. Yeah, do you anticipate then the cost of ferries that have not been converted to electric? Will the, the fee will go up due to this? The fee, which for, fee? For a passenger, for a passenger to ride on the ferry? I don't have that information, sorry. Okay. But if the revenue is being generated, if they're receiving a loan of credits, I can't speak to the, the fees that WashDOT would set, but this is kind of a separate process from that. Okay. So uh, through all of that credit generation, that's an opportunity for suppliers, producers of low carbon fuels to earn revenue to then uh, reinvest in things like purchasing alternative fuel vehicles, uh, investing, if you are a producer of a fuel, investing for low carbon fuel producing, uh, production, and also reducing the cost of low carbon fuels. The more, the more that they're used, the more available they are, the easier it becomes to supply them for a lower cost. So that's kind of, this is the end result of the program in addition to reducing emissions is kind of encouraging that market shift to make these low carbon fuels more available and more affordable. I do wanna note that there is a program fee for participation. So uh, this fee is just to cover the cost of implementation for ecology and it's, uh, divided among deficit generators and credit generators, the, the portion that credit generators will be paying is much, much smaller than those uh, that the deficit generators will be paying. So all credit generators will pay for 5% of the annual cost of the program divided among all credit generators. So we're anticipating that being a small, a small amount. And I don't have the exact numbers of what the fee will be because we will, in February, we will release an estimated annual budget and look at the number of registered participants uh, and kind of do that math of, of dividing the fee up among deficit and credit generators based on who is registered. Uh, we will then issue a fee. There will be a public comment period where we can receive feedback on the fee amount and then we will issue the fee after that. And in later years of the program, there is um, a little bit more. In 2023, there's a flat participation fee and then in, in future years, there's a small flat participation fee, but most of the fee goes to the gener credit, or excuse me, the deficit generators. And that's this, um, this table here is this, the, the breakdown of how we will be dividing the deficit generation fee just kind of for your information. So we'll, we'll be basing it on the amount of deficits incurred. Mm -hmm. um, Abby, um, Matt Hewish, City of Squim City Manager um, had a question, Matt? <laughs> well, uh, I had a couple, but I, I should probably wait till the the presentation is done. How long how long are the credits good for? And do you have any estimate of what they'll sell for? And it's a fascinating model, and I'm dying to know if it's been tested uh, in other I don't know states or countries. Even it's just it's so it's so innovative and uh, market driven financially, economically. It's. Uh, I, you know, I believe in incentives and it, you definitely are talking about some powerful ones there. So anyway, yeah. Absolutely. I will answer your questions in a little bit in reverse. So California, Oregon, British Columbia, and also the national government of Canada all have similar fuel standards. California's has been running for, I think actually oh, a little over a decade now, I think about 11 years. Oregon's has been running for six or seven years, I believe. And we have been learning a lot from them. Uh, yeah. We've been speaking to them quite a bit about, you know, what works well, what doesn't, what can be improved, uh, what do you wish you'd known in the first six months of implementing your program so that we can kind of build on what has come before us and not reinvent the wheel where we don't need to, but also improve where we can. And, and um, theirs is, their, their model is market driven with deficits and credits and, and it's the, the same, and the it's the model. same model. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So we do see, because it's difficult to anticipate what exactly the credit price will be because Ecology doesn't set the price, as I mentioned, and right. there are a lot of market forces driving what that price will be. We did see in California and Oregon that their credit price started pretty low at the, the beginnings of their program. I think, I can't remember exactly what it was, but um, I think it might've been in the, 
$60 per credit range, but, but please double check me on that. Um, now, Oregon's is about $120 per credit. Um, California's has been as high as almost $200. They fluctuated a little over this summer. It does change quite frequently because again, it's, it's market driven. Um, so i but we're anticipating that we, the opportunity, it's a great opportunity that we have that California and Oregon have gone before us because there are a lot of fuel suppliers that yep. already understand the program and are ready to go. And so we think there's going to be a lot of credit generation and, and deficit generation as well, just right from the get-go. But I do think that because any program is new, it kind of ramps up over time. So we will see the, the credit price might be a little modest at the beginning and then grow over time. But it's difficult to anticipate. So please take what I just said as, as an estimate and not no, it's, as that. It's fascinating. I, I'll, I'll let you keep going. But at the idea, uh, so do, in any of those models, does the credit value ever go away it, it, it's not like a crypto <laughs> currency or something i mean it it stays current right i mean has any model ever got devalued or or is it is it it looks sounds like it continues to escalate over years it continues so as long as there are deficits the credits will have value so the the value changes over time it fluctuates as you sure. know new fuels sure. come in the market and you know the more credits yeah and so as demand and supply fluctuate it changes a little bit but um we don't anticipate that that demand will go away and okay soon. thank you sorry to interrupt your presentation yeah, absolutely um and i'm i'm almost done so we can uh i want to make sure that we have time for claire's as well but also there will be time for questions after all right so a couple of things about um built-in mechanisms we have to ensure that some of the funds generated by or the revenue generated by the program is going back into communities. So electric utilities must reinvest 30% of the credit revenue that they generate through the program back into transportation electrification in overburdened communities. And they're also encouraged to invest up to 50% of their credit revenue in expanding access to zero emission transportation broadly. Uh, this is something Ecology and Washdot are working on um, determining eligible project types to be kind of a guideline for, for what those projects are and how they're implemented. Uh, and this is a structure that we have also seen in California and Oregon. And um, it's really exciting to see what they've been able to do with some of these funds. And utilities must then report their reinvestment activities back to Ecology so that we can kind of, you know, have a sense of how the revenue is being spent and, and what the projects that are coming out of this are. So Abby, your map doesn't show anything in Jefferson and Clallam counties. Are we to assume that uh, all of the areas in our counties are not high ranking overburdened communities? No, the map on the screen is from the uh, Washington Health Disparities, or excuse me, Washington Environmental Health Disparities map. This is just showing a high concentration of diesel pollution. So that's that's all this map is. Uh, okay. It's meant to be an example. It's not meant to indicate anything more than a high concentration of diesel pollution. Uh, yes, this is something that any utility that is participating will um, be required to reinvest the revenue that they generate through the program back into their service territory. So it is it is very much the revenue that is generated because of activity in their service territory, a part of that is uh, intended to go back into that community. So to give you a little bit of an idea of where we have been, um, we've done about a year and a half of rulemaking. As I mentioned, we just adopted the final rule on Monday, uh, which is very exciting. And so we are at the end of our rulemaking process. So I wanted to give you a little picture of what is coming next. So between now and January 1st, when the program launches, we are um, developing or finishing up development of the Washington Fuel Reporting System, the, our online platform where a lot of the program will take place, uh, and also finishing developing guidance documents, training materials, things that will help people participate in the program. So registration will open on January 1st. Uh, we will have trainings, webinars, uh, staff will be on call to provide technical support. Uh, and in January, the real requirements are uh, certain record keeping requirements and, and tracking the energy use during that quarter. Reporting will start after Q1 of calendar year 2023. So starting in April, in Q2 of calendar year 2023, parties will be required to report on the activity during Q1. So this is kind of the short term what is coming. Um, 
you know, just beyond the, the turn of the year. And um, with that, I will wrap up and leave my contact info for you here. Please feel free to reach out to me with questions. I am happy to speak with anyone, uh, give you some more specific information to your system or, or, or excuse me, to your situation uh, or just provide some general insight. So please, please reach out to me. Thank you very much. Great. So uh, Mike Skinner has a question in the chat. Mike, do you wanna ask your question? Sure, I just read an article this morning about hydrogen and it's um, losing ground to electric cars, electric vehicles, um, but it's a superior technology. And I'm just wondering, you know, how do we avoid getting into the sort of Betamax VHS debate about which is the, the, the best technology and which wins? Um, and is there a way to incentivize, use the, cre the, the credit uh, carbon market to incentivize getting straight to the best solutions? So ecology is technology neutral. We do not pick winners in this system. The market demand will drive where the credits go and therefore where the, the financial incentive goes. Um, in terms of hydrogen, just generally, I think we've seen in other states that the application for um, passenger vehicles lags a little behind. Um, electric cars are kind of taking the lead a little bit in passenger vehicles, but I think there's a huge amount of opportunity for things like heavy duty freight for hydrogen. I think that's an area that's very hard to electrify. And so hydrogen is really going to be a huge player. So I think if you only look at passenger vehicles, you know, just remember that that's only part of the equation. There are a lot of other applications out there that are gonna be very, very useful. Okay, great. Um, Thank you. Any other questions for Abby? Let's see. If not, We'll, uh, let's see, Jim, do you want to ask your question? Sure, thank you. Uh, yeah, wrote it in the chat. Abby, do you have any information on uh, the other states that have implemented this fairly fairly identical program in the past? What the, what the impact on wholesale uh, traditional, i.e. fossil fuel prices have been, uh, and then the, the ultimate downstream impact on retail fuel prices. So I believe California has done several studies on that. Um, and I will try and track those down during Claire's presentation and drop some links in the chat. I can tell you that overall, any state regulatory program has less of an impact on the price of consumer fuels than say uh, issues with global supply chain, things like the pandemic, the, the war in Ukraine, um, and, and decisions made by fuel providers. So there is uh, some impact, but all the studies that have been done on both estimates of future programs in our case, or also as, uh, analyses that have been done on existing programs in California and Oregon have shown very minimal impact. If, if I may also, just a sort of a ancillary follow-on question. We have a, a privately owned international ferry here in Clallam County uh, and also Victoria, BC. Um, they're not a public entity, obviously, but can they uh, become a credit generator uh, similar to the government-owned Washington State ferries? I think they could be, I think without knowing the particulars of the situation um, or excuse me, of their operation, I wouldn't be able to say for sure, but if they are using a low carbon fuel that is below the carbon intensity standard for that particular year, then they could opt in and generate credits. Okay, great. Um, Representative Theringer or Jack or Kevin, do you guys have any questions of Abby about the low carbon fuel standard program? If not, oh, go ahead. No, I, I don't. I, I, I thought it was a great presentation that sort of distills out. Obviously, there's big advantages that we're not the first. And I think there's also advantages that this is a regional approach between, you know, the coast. I know there's always discussion about, you know, we're a small portion and, you know, the global carbon issue is, a, is global. And why, do, why should we do this? And I think... Um, 
part in this case, you know, the fact that there's a large region that's doing this that generates momentum, I think, for these policies. And I think that that's important. And in this moment, anything we can do, I think, is beneficial. Thanks, Steve. Um, Darlene? Have you considered or uh, would this be part of the program using synthetic fuels from waste? Uh, yes, if the carbon intensity of how those fuels is produced is below the carbon intensity for that year. So if, if it's a low carbon synthetic fuel, I believe the answer is yes, but we will, um, the, looking at the carbon intensity of a fuel is a very individualized process because every fuel is made somewhat differently. So it would depend on what exactly the production process is, but any low carbon fuel, there's an opportunity for it to enter the market. And certainly fuels made from waste that, you know, if you're, if you're the feedstock for your fuel isn't something that you are creating, if it's a waste from another process that lowers the carbon intensity of your fuel. So there's opportunity there. Great. All right. Thank you, Thank Abby. You. Um, Claire, do you want to take it and you can share your screen if you have slides as well? Sure. Thank, Thank you. you for joining us. Yeah, sorry, I was late. My computer decided to update overnight and that's always a journey. Um, all right, let me share my screen with you. One second. There we go. All right. Can everybody see that okay? Yes. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Claire Boyd White, and I'm the communication specialist for the Climate Commitment Act Implementation Group over in the Air Quality Program, uh, right alongside Abby, different program, same group. Um, so we're going to talk about the Climate Commitment Act, and I'm going to do what she did, give you kind of an overview of how it works. And you'll see some similarities and some differences. Um, another program that California did first, and we are getting to benefit from them going first and uh, not reinventing the wheel all the way, but getting to improve in some places that are pretty important. So um, yeah, you'll see some similarities. All right, we're gonna cover program basics, um, then talk about implementation, just like Abby's program, um, CFS, we launch on January 1. That looks a little bit different for us, but we're, we're gearing up. So talk about where we are and where we're going. And then um, I'd like to touch a, a little bit on auction proceeds. So unlike Abby's program, um, the auctions that are the, the linchpin of the Cap and Invest program do generate significant revenue for the state. And so that's a big question we usually get is what happens with that money. So we'll talk about that a little bit and then touch on linkage. Um, and I think, uh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't note your name, mentioning that, you know, it's a regional kind of push to do these sorts of programs. Um, and again, you know, California having a cap and trade, Oregon having a similar kind of program, but much smaller. Um, the West Coast has been leading the way on climate policy, and we continue to do so. So we're excited to, to um, bolster those efforts with these two big programs. So the way that the Cap and Invest program works is basically we take a look at um, statewide greenhouse gas emissions and we cap them. So essentially we look at what's out there for um, for covered emissions, and I'll touch on what that means in a, in a second. Uh, and then we sort of lower that cap over time in order to meet some statutory goals that are set in state law. Um, and I'll, and I'll, I'll highlight those in a second as well. So essentially it creates a financial incentive over time. Um, the emissions allowances are equivalent to that uh, emissions um, cap. So you might hear somebody talk about the emissions cap or the allowance budget, and those are largely interchangeable terms. And since businesses have to purchase in many, in most cases, these allowances equal to their covered emissions, as there are fewer and fewer allowances issued over time, they become more valuable. So it's another market-based program where it financially incentivizes uh, businesses to decarbonize in the most efficient way possible, you know, for both their businesses and what is best for their consumers. Um, and so, yeah, it creates that that um, upward and also a revenue generating potential. So two kinds of incentives there. Um, so as I mentioned, entities that are covered by the program need to obtain allowances equal to their covered emissions. Um, some entities do receive allowances at no cost, and that was designated by the legislature. So that includes natural gas and electric utilities and what we call emissions intensive trade exposed 
um, industries or EITEs, uh, which includes oil refineries. So fuel suppliers are not included, but oil refineries are. Um, and it's basically lots of heavy, heavy manufacturing, um, big economic drivers. And the purpose of that is though they receive no cost allowances, the amount in the case of EITEs declines over time. And the purpose is to allow those very big businesses that might not be able to kind of pivot on a dime, uh, change their operations, a little bit of wiggle room in the early years so that they can figure out a way to decarbonize efficiently while retaining those industries in state. And importantly, retaining those emissions in state, which sounds kind of counterintuitive, but we would prefer that those emissions happen in a state where there's a regulatory program in place that can encourage that decarbonization, then the, those industries move out of state where there's no such regulatory program in place um, and the emissions could, could increase unchecked. Um, so whether you are a covered entity, an opt-in entity, or what we call a general market participant, which is essentially investors, you can hold um, allowances either to use for future years compliance or to generate revenue um, by selling them. So there's, there's flexibility um, either if you are uh, an entity that has what we call a compliance obligation, which means you have to participate, you need to obtain allowances equal to your covered emissions, um, there is uh, there's flexibility in how you strategize your your compliance, um, and then for investors, there's there's flexibility there as well. So I mentioned covered emissions, and that's an important term that covered um, because it doesn't include the entire economy. It's roughly economy wide. So whereas Abby's program is talking about fuels specifically, um, a lot of different kinds of emissions are covered by the CCA. So you can see that the general rule is that 25,000 metric tons of um, carbon dioxide equivalent. So it also it covers more than just CO2. But the way we look at that is we aggregate um, those different kinds of greenhouse gases and, and sort of measure them in the equivalent of CO2 so that we have sort of an apples to apples situation because every industry has different kinds of emissions. Um, but does uh, cover the fuel suppliers for gasoline and on-road diesel, uh, electricity, natural gas, and then we're adding waste to energy facilities in 2027 and in 2031 railroads. Originally, the statute was written to also cover landfills starting uh, in 2031. However, there was recently a uh, separate piece of legislation passed uh, that is a specific methane reduction program for landfills. So they were removed from this program. Uh, not covered are obviously smaller businesses with lower emissions, agricultural operations. So fuels that are are um, combusted uh, for agricultural purposes are not covered. So a fuel supplier, for example, that sells largely to agricultural operations, um, if they show documentation that that's where those gallons go, those gallons are not considered, the emissions from those gallons are not considered um, covered. And then aviation fuels and most marine fuels, that comes down largely to uh, jurisdiction. We can't uh, regulate fuel combusted outside of our state um, and also not being, you know, not wanting to supersede any federal laws or um, interstate commerce. So, so I mentioned- oh. Claire, quickly about that. Um, so for fishing vessels that wanted to convert then, they, there wouldn't be any um, uh, funds available for them to be able to convert from diesel to electric. So the the conversion uh, from from a uh, uh, to to an electrification or a lower carbon intensity fuel that's more of a, a, a CFS question. Okay. The 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 fisherman's boat is not regulated by the CCA. The those gallons are regulated further upstream, and so if he was if this fisherman was going to convert to an electrified boat, um, that might be something that has an impact under the CFS. But under the CCA, that wouldn't really play a role. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I mentioned the emissions cap and how we need to decrease it over time, um, creating that financial incentive. And the reason we need to decrease it over time is because there are some pretty robust emissions reductions commitments set in state law. And Abby, I apologize, I missed the beginning of your presentation. I don't know if you already mentioned these. So if this is repetitive, I'm sorry, everyone. Um, but basically, the state is committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 45% by 2030, 70% by 2040, and 95% by 2050, uh, which are pretty aggressive targets, especially that near-term 2031. So you can see that dark blue line, that uh, emissions reduction, that cap reduction in the first few years is pretty steep. It's about 7% per year. And that is what is required for us to hit that 45% reduction by 2030. Um, and then it, it becomes a little shallower thereafter. 
So emissions allowances are, are sort of the, the primary part of this, and they are mostly obtained through auctions um, hosted by Ecology. We'll have four quarterly auctions. I'll touch on those a little bit later. Um, and so that's the primary way that a covered entity uh, sort of um, obtains what we call compliance instruments uh, to cover their covered emissions. The other piece of that are offset credits. So offsets are projects that um, either reduce, avoid, or um, reduce, avoid, <laughs> or, or absorb uh, uh, carbon from the atmosphere. And you are allowed to use offset credits under the CCA to cover a small portion of covered emissions, but it's very limited, and those limits are set in state law. Um, so in the first four years, it is 5% um, of a compliance obligation can be covered with offset credits generally, and then an additional 3% if you um, get offset credits from projects that are on federally recognized tribal lands. And then after those first four years, those limits reduce to 4% generally, and then an additional 2% for those tribal projects. Um, again, as Abby, as Abby mentioned, we are, we are getting to build off of California's program. And because developing what's called an offset protocol is quite a, a labor intensive and long-term process, we wanted to be able to implement offset credits as part of the Capital Invest program right away. So we um, recently adopted our big rule at the end of September that really was the program structure, how the auctions are going to work, all that good stuff. And in that rule, we adopted four offset protocols from the California program, slightly tweaked, obviously, to, to apply to Washington. And those are forestry, urban forestry, livestock, um, and ozone removal projects. So um, that is a potential for, for um, emitters to use offset credits, but again, it's very, very limited. And there are some pretty strict requirements in the law about the types of projects that can qualify under this program. So um, I'm not sure if people are familiar with uh, with non-regulatory offset markets, but the requirements under our regulatory market are, are quite stringent. So implementation, I just mentioned that we adopted our rule end of September. So that was that was the big, the big, big lift. Um, and now that that has gone into effect, we are gearing up for our January 1 launch. Now, our January 1 launch is a little different than Abby's where people start registering. Basically on January 1 for us, what that means is emissions start counting. So um, the first compliance deadline isn't until the following year and our first auction won't be until the second half of February. So it's it's a little bit of a yay, but nothing actually happens on that day one, um, but it'll still be pretty momentous. So right now the big thing we're doing is working on um, our emissions report verification. So receiving and verifying emissions reports from lots of different sectors. We are still receiving information from fuel suppliers, from electric power entities. Um, and part of that is facilitating a lot of trainings and providing tools and resources um, and recordings and slide decks and, and a lot of one-on-one um, -on -one interaction to help people um, engage with this program effectively and get their registration set up. So that's a lot of what we're doing right now. Uh, in addition, we're also developing our third party verification program, the greenhouse gas reporting program that is sort of where the emissions data for this comes from requires um, that emitters have a contract with a third party, an independent third party that specializes in verifying emissions reports. And so that that's a, a, another layer of sort of quality control. So entities aren't able to just say, oh, our emissions were super low this year. They have to submit reports. Ecology verifies them, and they're also responsible for contracting with a third-party verifier, and so making sure that those verifiers understand our program and what our um, reporting requirements are is a, is a big lift, so developing that program is in the works, and also our offset program for offset project developers who might want to uh, create projects that fall into those four protocols that we discussed. Um, our auction platform registration opened in October, which was another, another big hurrah. Um, so that's ongoing right now. We've got um, a lot of people starting to register and that requires a lot of identity verification, uh, analysis of corporate structure and um, ownership structure to ensure that we have a secure and stable market. So that's another big thing that's going on right now. As you can tell, we're very busy in air quality. <laughs> so um, that's all stuff that's happening as we get up to that January one 
uh, launch date. And then the next big thing is that we'll be holding a practice auction sometime in January. We haven't um, decided the, the date yet so that people can kind of get a feel for how it's actually going to work. Although prior to that, we will be hosting trainings. Um, we have hosted and are continuing to host trainings on, on how to access and use that platform. Um, and then our first auction will be the second half of February. By statute, we need to give 60 days notice at least before any auction. So we will be issuing notice of our first auction date in December, um, and we'll send out an email and let everybody know. And then we'll have four quarterly auctions each calendar year. And, and the auctions are um, participation in the program is mandatory for covered entities. However, they don't have to participate in a given auction. Again, they have absolute control over their compliance strategy, um, which auctions they participate in, how many allowances they um, bid for and what they bid, um, all of their operational decisions are still 100% their own. So uh, we do anticipate robust participation in this first auction and in the first four auctions, um, but the, the data remains to be seen. So that will be a very interesting um, very interesting thing to see once we start getting information in. After so that. Claire, do you have a list of um, covered entities? I don't have a list of covered entities. And part of that is because, as I mentioned, oh, excuse me, we are still um, receiving and verifying um, emissions reports from some pretty big sectors. So we don't have a complete list of, of who is covered. We did issue notice to some entities on October 4th, um, but it was not everybody that's covered. Do you know if any entities within Clallam County were notified? I, I could not say off the top of my head. Um, I can I could check with my auctions team about who was notified, but I, I honestly I don't have that information in front oh, of me. Okay, sorry. Um, but if you're asking about like a like a PUD like utility electric utility or something, they have not been issued notice because that's one of the sectors that we have not received all our data from yet. Um. Okay, so let's talk about uh, that auction, those auction dollars. That's a big That's a big topic. We get this question a lot. Um, so the big takeaway is that all of the funds, and it is anticipated to be quite a lot of money, our most recent analysis, um, which is based on the, the most recent California prices, well, not this past one because our analysis happened before this very last auction, but the four prior to that, based on um, based on their average prices and our estimate of how many allowances are going to be sold in any uh, given calendar year, it looks like in the first uh, full fiscal year, so that will be fiscal year 24, uh, which is um, July 1st, 2024 through June 30th, 2025, uh, fiscal years are fun. Uh, that first, first full fiscal year should be almost a billion dollars. So it's a substantial amount of revenue and it's really important to know where that goes. So in statute, three um, three main accounts and there are some sub accounts off of two of them, but these are the three main accounts were created um, to hold this money and earmark it for specific kinds of projects in Washington state. Now, the actual specific projects or grant programs or what have you that get funded, all that's subject to legislative appropriation. So the legislature will choose funds to allocate based on budget proposals from different agencies and, and you know governor's budget proposals, all that stuff. So ecology actually has no authority over who gets money for what. Uh, we, I like to say we're kind of like the money butler. We, we have the auction and we give it a nice home to live, um, but we don't actually get to choose where it goes. But we do know from statute that that first account, uh, CIRA, the Carbon Emissions Reduction Account, that is earmarked for uh, projects that target the decarbonization of the transportation industry. As I'm sure Abby mentioned, that's our biggest source of emissions. And so it's really important that we start moving towards um, cleaner fuels, um, more alternative transit, alternatives to single passenger vehicles, and also more infrastructure for biking, walking, that kind of thing. So those are the types of projects um, funds in that account are earmarked for. The climate investment account is um, it first it funds the administration of the program, but there's a cap on how much funding can be used for that. And then the rest of it is earmarked for projects that um, focus on climate resilience in our ecosystems and communities. So that could be working on uh, flood rehabilitation or shoring up our aquatic ecosystems um, against, against uh, ocean acidification, that kind of thing. It can also be for helping um, train uh, train workers to transition to new clean energy jobs. So those kinds of programs are in that um, SIA climate investment account. And the last one, the air quality and health disparities improvement account, 
everything in the CCA is very catchily named, um, is earmarked for projects that focus on addressing issues of environmental justice and health and equity in our state. And one of those um, pieces that's that's pretty big is a piece that we, we call internally section three, but it's called the Improving Air Quality in Overburdened Communities Initiative. Um, and that focuses on basically looking at what under the very specific parameters of this piece of the law constitutes an overburdened community that is highly impacted by air pollution, because you might be highly impacted by water pollution or something else, but this is an air quality program, so it's focused on air pollution. And then expanding our existing air quality monitoring network in those communities, um, and then using that data and other data to design and implement strategies to help reduce uh, what we call criteria air pollutants in those communities. So greenhouse gases are atmospheric, and that's why an offset project that reduces greenhouse gases you know, in, in France is still a benefit to us in Washington because it's global. But there are other kinds of air pollution that are much more localized, such as ozone or fine particulates. And so this section really focuses on that kind of air quality. Um, and so funding from this account goes to help things like expanding that air quality network. Air, excuse me, air quality monitoring work. I apologize. So, my, Claire, to my bring it, is very interested in this. <laughs> to, to bring it um, to our community, I looked at the uh, the map um, called the health disparities map. I think it was, mm -hmm. and um, and so it shows that just Port Angeles area has is ranked anywhere from um, six down to four. And so um, if there was an entity in our county, would they be able to ensure that they were investing in our county? Or do they, like say if it was our PUD, do they have to invest in something outside of our county? So the entities themselves, the, the emitters, are not investing in any project. They need to obtain allowances and then the, the funds from their purchase of those allowances go into these accounts and the legislature appropriates projects. So the emitter themselves is not investing in a project anywhere. Um, they, are, they are purchasing compliance instruments and then that funding gets allocated. As for communities, so the section three, the Improving Air Quality and Overburdened Communities Initiative, you can see why we say section three. Um, is, is about overburdened communities highly impa impacted by air pollution. And while that health disparities map is a piece of that analysis, the specific uh, list of um, indicators that are being used to identify those communities is still in draft form. They haven't completed that process, but it will not just be that health disparities map. There are several layers of different kinds of things that impact, um, that, that sort of determine what constitutes being highly impacted by air pollution. So I just, that's not the, not to look at that map, but that is not the end all be all of what constitutes an overburdened community. Um, there are other pieces of data that are involved. Um, but to answer your question, the the emitter themselves, their their funds from the purchase of compliance instruments go into a larger pool of funds mm -hmm. that are then appropriated by the legislature. Um, okay, so um, touch a little bit on environmental justice, obviously very important. Um, another big call out in the law that focuses on that, and this is sort of thing that we learned from California, which didn't have something like this built into the statute originally, and then they added sort of environmental justice focuses later, is that uh, a minimum of 35% of all auction revenue with a goal set in statute of 40% has to go to projects that provide direct benefit to overburdened communities. So there is a, there is a mechanism in place to ensure that a very large chunk of these funds improve the lives of people who sort of bear a disproportionate share of the burdens of climate change right now. And then 10% um, needs to go to projects that have tribal support. So a, a, a pretty hefty percentage. Um, and then there's also some accountability measures built in. We need to give annual reports to the legislature and to the Environmental Justice Council and any agency that receives CCA funding for a grant program or, or what have you needs to report to the EJ Council on their progress towards their agency, specifically environmental, their own environmental justice goals. So there's a lot of accountability baked in to ensure that this very powerful uh, revenue driver actually gets used to benefit everybody in the state. 
And I'm just going to touch briefly on linkage. Essentially, this is just when multiple cap and invest programs in different jurisdictions sort of join together. So California and Quebec currently have a linked market. And um, while we don't know that we're going to link because it requires a totally separate process with public input and, and all of that, um, we're going to start looking at that process soon. And the law did direct us to develop a, pro a program that could potentially link. So we've done a lot of things um, like California and Quebec have done, A, because they did it well and it, and it works. Um, no need to reinvent the wheel, but also because we're what we call linkage ready. So that doesn't mean we definitely will link, but if that is decided to be beneficial, it won't require a total overhaul of the program, which is important. Um, so as I mentioned, it's going to be a separate process, and there's a lot of very specific criteria that we need to sort of make sure are met in order to determine whether or not it's beneficial. And then, you know, California and Quebec would also need to do their own process and determine that it's beneficial to their communities to link with us. So it's it's a pretty long process, but we are starting to kind of look at the logistics of what that analysis looks like um, now, and we will continue building that out um, throughout the next year. All right, we're running tight on time. There's my contact info. As Abby said, I am more than happy to answer any questions uh, here or afterwards. Please feel free to reach out. Does anyone have questions? It looks as though uh, in the chat, Jim, did you have a question you'd like to approach? Sure, I've got to, I've got to remember what the question was, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, it says have potential negative economic effects to the forest products industry been studied? Yeah, right. Yeah, that's if either public or private, privately owned forest lands um, as a business decision decide to generate um, credits. Awesome. I don't know if that's the right term or not. Obviously, trees that would have been cut won't be. Has any have any studies been done to figure out exactly what the negative economic impacts to the industry and then downstream to the communities might be given given those decisions? Uh, you know, I, I am not aware of any such studies, um, but actually Andy Hayes has joined us, who is on our policy team. He's our policy section manager and a bit of an offsets expert. So I might actually hand that to Andy. Okay. So there's um, though the so the timber industry, of course, would be regulated like other industries in terms of the cost of production associated there. There there'd be an emissions intensive uh, trade exposed uh, industry. And so they would be regulated and given no cost allowances um, like other industries um, to continue their operations. The 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 other way in which I think uh, timber industry might be influenced is through carbon offsets. Um, and so the the. The forestry offset program would allow um, uh, timber industry, if they uh, company decided they wanted to participate and put some of their lands into a carbon project, could work with a project developer um, and get uh, offsets developed that could be then, then put on the market and then be purchased by, um, uh, essentially purchased by other companies who were looking to meet their compliance obligation through the use of offsets, as as Claire mentioned earlier in the presentation. Does that Does that answer your question? Not not really, but we're out of time. So I I'm not aware of any analyses of, of whether or not participation like basically what Andy said, developing an offset project on, on Timberland that could be used for logging for paper, whatever. And instead of doing that, they keep the trees because they are a carbon sink. Right. I am not aware of any studies on the negative impacts on the pulp and paper or timber industry based on those decisions. Yeah, I'm just thinking of jobs and ancillary activities like trucking and fuel and so on and so forth you know if to the extent uh, trees aren't being put on trucks to be taken to a mill uh, those jobs are in jeopardy hmm. well and i guess that's the kind of the just and we are we are out of time but the, you know that's sort of that market mechanic that we've talked about a couple of times is that the businesses that are covered or um, opt in to participate or decide to become offset project developers they retain full control of all their business decisions. So if it isn't in the best interest of them economically, they probably won't do it. Um, so, you know, we, we have to rely on our business owners to know what's best for their businesses. I'm gonna stop sharing. 
Thank you for your question, Jim. I, I do want to thank Abby, Claire, and Andy for joining us today from the Washington State Department of Ecology, and a special thanks to the Climate Policy Section Manager, Joel Creswell, who set this um, uh, group in place to present to Clallam County's uh, Coffee with Colleen chat today. I can see some of the other questions in the chat and I can try to get the answers to those questions as we have run out of time today. And I just wanna wish everyone a great weekend and thank you for joining us and we will see you next week. Thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. Appreciate it, bye-bye.